So the basic flow of this application is going to be program launches. I want it to provide for me a, a way to add a student and then from that student to add classes, to sign up for classes. So now this is going to be overly simplistic in the user experience, but the end goal here is to provide mechanisms to do all of this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have my main form. I'm going to add a list box. and a label this will be my list of students I'm going to add a second list box and a label and these will be my enrollments so what I want to be able to do at the end is I want to be able to add a student, type that student's information in, have that student appear in the list box. I can then click on the student, go to a button underneath enrollments, and click add enrollments. At which point I can then go out and find a course, sign up for the course, add the course, and have the course show up in the enrollments box for that student. Okay. So I'll put a button down here called Add Student. Another button Add Enrollment. Now to facilitate all of this, we're actually going to have to create two more forms. So to do that, I'm going to right click on my program, my CP Week 6, do Add, just making sure I'm recording, right click on the project, CP Week 6, Add, and then I'm just going to do a new item, Windows Form. This will be the add student form. Looks just like our first form. Right click again, add item, add enrollment form. <clears throat> I'm going to get the enrollment form out of the way for right now. Focus on the add student form. So a student, if I go back to my models, has a name and a student ID number. It's a good starting point, doesn't have to be too complicated. So we'll have to add two labels and two text boxes. Make it all pretty. This will be student name. And this will be student ID. going to want to change the names of my text boxes and that Hungarian notation that we talked about I personally like to still use it on controls just because it helps me quickly identify what kind of control I'm dealing with sometimes you may find that you have two different kinds of controls and it makes sense to name them the same name but you want to be able to find them quickly or you want to be able to find all the text boxes with a few keystrokes so if you're looking for a text box you always know it's going to be txt something so 
that is a personal preference of mine so txt student name txt student id and then I'll have a button that is nope, I'll just leave this out button add student the text will say add <coughs> and a button that says cancel Oh, video's done. BTN cancel. Shorten up the form. Perfect. All right, so that's our form. That's the layout for it. Now we need to have our main form launch the child form. So I'm going to make this a btn add student, giving it a name. Then double click on it, gives me my event handler. And what I want to do is I want to actually create that form and then show it. So if you remember from our program.cs, the way this works, the way that our program starts up is that it still enters that static void main but then it does the series of calls and then finally it says run new form one form one is it's not very visual form one is our form so we actually want to create a new instance of add student form and then show it so in our button click we're gonna say we have to declare this as a variable so our data type our class is add student form add stu form that's that's what I'm going to name my variable. Add student form. I'm going to say equals new. Add student form. So if you read that as English, it's create a variable of add student form and put inside of it a new form, a new instance of the add student form form. <coughs> then from there, I can just say add student form. I'm now talking to that instance of the form. And I'm saying show. F5, compile and run. Here's our main form. Click add student. And there's our second form. So we now have an application that has two forms. These are mutually exclusive. I can actually move these around in any order. I don't have to interact with this in order to come back and interact with this. And I can launch another one if I want launch 30 of them if I want but this form 1 is the primary form that runs my application and because of that the moment this one's closed everybody disappears now that's good and that's bad if you don't know it yet you'll learn end users do this they go like this I need to check my email. I come back. Where'd my user go? Add student, and then I get a new one. Oh, got a new email. Go back. I don't know what happened. Keep losing stuff. I have 12 of these open because I didn't realize it. And then I closed it and I lost everything. So, what we want to do is we want to treat it more like a dialogue. When you do a file open, I can't get back to the application until I get rid of this. So instead of doing an, a show, we can say show dialog. Doing a show dialog, recompile, run. I can't get back to that main form until I do something with this form. I can close the form, which brings me back into control. But if I have this open and I flip out and then I go back, I still have to deal with this form first. That's the experience we want to have. So show dialog is what we want. When we call show dialog, we actually have the ability now to return a dialog result. 
So when we did the file open and the file save, that dialog result came back from show dialog. Show dialog returns a pro or has a return value of dialog result. And if you look at what a dialog result is, it's not the one I want. You have abort, cancel, ignore, no, none, okay, retry, and yes. If you look at our form properties, you'll find that the form also has a special property called, it's going to make a liar out of me, but I know it's here. It's here, I know it. <laughs> Actually, it's not on the form. I take that back. It's on the button. called dialog result. So on your <coughs> button clicks you can actually wire into them the dialog result that that button should reply with. So what does that mean? Cancel, pretty obvious one. The dialog result for the cancel button will be cancel. The dialog result for the add button, we're going to set it to OK. So if I declare a variable, dialog result result, and I say result equals add student show dialog, I'm actually going to put a breakpoint. Uh, let me do this, and then we'll do message box dot show result f5 failed. string. So if I click add, it's going to launch the dialog box, show dialog. If I hit cancel, what gets returned to the result is cancel. So when this method show dialog is called, remember that things are evaluated from right to left. So it gets to this line of code, result equals add stew form dot dialog, or dot show dialog. The first thing it does is says, show the dialog box. Window opens up. It waits for me to interact with that window and do whatever it is I need to do on that window. And then finally, when I click that OK button or that cancel button, that's the cue to the form to say, done, close, take the dialog result from the button, return it. So when I click that cancel button on the add student form, that dialog result that we set in the property gets returned here. All right, let's walk through that one more time with the add button. So the add button property dialog result is set to okay. So when this button is clicked, the dialog result that's returned back to the main form is okay. F5. I'm going to add one more breakpoint here just so you can see. I click Add Student. The form is created. We're now evaluating this line. So the first thing that's going to happen is any work on the right side. Add Stu Form dot Show Dialog. That will cause the box to appear. Come back. We then click Add. The Add button had the OK dialog result. The result that was returned is OK. We can then evaluate that dialog result and decide logically what do we do next in our program. Did they hit OK? Did they hit Cancel? If they hit Cancel, we don't need to create a student. We don't need to do any of that work. We just need to fail silently. If they hit OK, that means that their student data somewhere that we need to capture. We need to get to that data because we need to create that student object. So that's the basic idea of what we want to accomplish here. 
So we're going to say show form eval result. We'll say if the result equals cancel return do nothing. Easy enough. Else result is okay. We will want to get student name and student ID from the add stew form. We want to create a new student, store student in some sort of a repository, show students in repository, and repository could be a list. So I don't want the terminology to confuse you. Show students in repository in the list box. Okay, so those are our steps. Since there was an OK, we need to get that student data, create a student object, add them to our repository of students, our list of students, students that are being dynamically added, and then finally present those students in that list box somehow. Now, there's multiple ways to pass data from one form to another. Okay, So that's the mechanics that we have to have happen here, is we have to be able to pass data from the add student form to form one. Because the information, the student name and the student ID is actually being input into add student form. We need to get that data out of that form and add it to our main form. So shipping data can happen in a lot of different ways. The most simplistic way is because we have a trigger and we have what's essentially considered a synchronous process. We can't, the main form can't do anything until the add student form is gone because we made it a dialog box. So that we're guaranteed that if the user hits OK and everything goes to plan, that we should then end up receiving an a student or student data from the add student form. So I'm going to make that assumption. If that assumption doesn't make complete sense to you right now, that's okay. But what that means is that we can then poke a hole in our form as a pathway of communication between the two forms. And we're going to do that by creating a public property on the add student form. So in order to facilitate this, we're actually going to go to code view. And this right now is all the code that is on this form. We have two text boxes. We have student name and student ID. So we could create two public properties, public string student name string student ID. By create, remember, this form is just a class. So we can add properties, methods, we can do whatever we want to it. Because this is a class and we created an instance of that class right here, just like with the student or the course or the professor, we can come in here and say, add stu form, student ID, or student name. So we've now poked a hole or provided a communication path from one form to the other. Now having to juggle two properties is a, it can be a little cumbersome. So what I'm going to recommend doing instead is what we've been kind of talking about today is I just want to return a student. 
I'm going to call it the created student. Now, again, the logistics of how this works in these declarations, you have public student. It's going to say that the type or namespace of student is not found. Well, we created that class, but it lives inside of a different namespace. It lives inside that models folder. So what we need to do here is use the accelerator and say using cpweek6.models. So that lights up, makes that class available. Our property name is now called created student. When the user clicks this add button, we want to create that student object. So upon click, we're going to do some quick validation. So if string is null or white space txt student ID dot text message box dot show student ID required txt student ID focus return if string is null or white space txt student name dot text message box dot show student name is required txt student name dot focus return so we're basically validating is there text in both of those boxes if there isn't text in one of the boxes throw up a message box notice say hey you need to fill this in put the cursor in the text box give it focus and then get out of the method one more thing that we will have to also do is we have to say that the dialog result equals uh, it's not null it's dialog result dot ignore is none that's what I'm looking for and we do this because if we don't then it'll cause the OK to get sent back to the main form. By setting it to none, we terminate that process and it keeps us focused on that box. So you can think of this as stop exit. Or stop close, maybe is a better way to describe it. Because we don't want that little dialog box to close, we want it to stay there. Okay. So if I have five, um, just comment that out. So you do add student, hit add, student ID required, puts us in the student ID box. One, two, three, four, five. I then click add which will bring us into this space which will also then trigger that result of OK and we work our way out because we don't really have anything coded up at this point yeah, yeah. It, it would work as well. The, the nice thing about this method is that it checks for both null and empty strings. Well, well, empty strings. Well, I'm saying empty strings, not null, but empty strings. Right. If you put empty strings, mm -hmm. that should be enough, right? Is there any... The white space will also consider just white space, like spaces. But it would not be... Uh, right, so if I just put in a bunch of... If I just put my elbow on the keyboard and I put a bunch of spaces in there, your empty string will not equal oh, my white no. space. Okay? So, so that is... Be character. Yes. I mean, it has to... 
It has to be a character. Yes, right. it has to be a it's number, a letter, or like something. Yes. Okay. Yep. There was another method there, and I probably went too fast. There is null or empty. That was from an earlier version of the framework. Then they realized people like to put spaces in boxes, so they evolved it to null or white space. So, a long time ago, I used to do it that way. Equals null or equals empty string. So, and that's the thing. I mean, it's there are little nuances, and if you do it every day, you pick them up. If C sharp isn't your everyday language, then yeah, there are things to remember. <laughs> All right, so we go through and we validate. The next thing is create student. So we're going to declare a student variable. And then we're going to say stu equals new student. And I'm going to do the inline initialization. So I'm going to say that the name equals txt student name dot text and the student ID equals txt student ID dot text. So we've now created a student and then we'll say the created student equals stu. So created student is our property. I'm going to add some notate some explanation here. This is the student that is created after the form is completed look for dialog results okay so we create a student variable just to work with we initialize that student variable with txt student name dot text and the student ID with txt student ID dot text and then what we'll, the last step is that we have that property that communication way from this form to the main form and we need to take that student object and actually put it in that pipeline the pipeline is property is called created stu so we say created stu equals stu or created student equals stu so now that stu that new student we just created is actually stored <coughs> So then what should happen for us is that when we come back to the main form, we can then say student s equals add stu form dot created stu or created student. So s then becomes our local reference to that student object that was created inside the form. So we no longer have to create the student. The student's already created for us. We then just need to add the kid to a list and then bind the list to the list box. So we don't want to say list student students equals new because if we do that we run into that loop of we just keep creating a new list and adding one kid and we blow away the old ones and create a new list and add a new kid. So we need to bring this list of students out of the scope of our event handler. My recommendation is go to the very top of your class, put them there. Then in your constructor, student equals new list of student. So when the form is created, this line gets called, but the declaration is outside the scope of any methods so it then can be seen by all methods. So we'll say students dot add s, which is our student variable, and then we can say load students list box. That's a method that I'm declaring. I'm creating. this method does not exist yet so I'm going to come down to the end of my event handler and I'm going to say private void 
load students list box. And let me jump back to my designer. I did not give my boxes names. So this will be LST students. And this will be LST enrollments. So LST students dot. And there's a lot of different ways of doing bindings. Uh, there is a data source property, and we can say that students equals LST students dot data source. The the data source property and the bindings conventions are a little finicky. Sometimes they work great. Other times you'll end up spending three hours trying to get the bindings to work because the right type of like internal event didn't happen and things don't work. So that's a word of warning. We'll try it this way. If it doesn't work, I'll show you the brute force approach. I'll probably show it to you anyway. So let's see, I'm gonna put breakpoint, breakpoint. I just want to kind of show you what's happening here as the code executes. Breakpoint. Validate, validate, student, okay. All right, so F6, good compile, F5. All right, so the program has now kicked off. The form hasn't loaded yet. Where we are is we are executing this line of code right here, which says new form one. Because we're saying new form one, the form one constructor is running. So we're now taking the students list, which is currently null. And what that means is that you have declared a variable of students, and you've told the computer, I need you to carve out a space for a list of students. The computer knows how to do that. It knows how to find a spot in memory and carve out that space. So the computer says, OK, I'm going to carve out x number of bytes for you. Your space starts at memory address 1002. Here's a pointer to that. Here's a ticket that tells you where that lives. When you're ready, put some stuff inside of it and use this ticket to tell me where to put it. So this statement alone says, create a space. It's null. It's empty. It's void. There's nothing in it. This statement of students equals new list student says, OK, computer, here's my ticket go put a list inside. So when I call students from now on, go find that list and get it for me. So we're initializing. Form comes up. We click add student. We jump into this event handler. We're going to call show dialog. There's our dialog box. <laughs> So we'll put a name, student ID, click add. We are now inside of add student form. We're inside of the add student click event handler. And we're going to go through and validate that these are not null or white space. Success. We're then going to create a new student with the text values from the text boxes, storing it in stu. So stu now has a student. If we expand the student, we'll see that courses is null, name is Kevin Gantos, student ID is 12345. We then take that student and we're going to put it inside of the created student property. This line has not been evaluated, so created student is again another one of those carved out spaces. It doesn't have anything in it, it's null but we're going to store in it the student object. So we run. We've now exited the form. So once this line ran, it then kicked us back out. The dialog result was returned of OK. We're now inside 
of form one again, evaluating more code. So we're looking at the eval. Is the eval cancel? No. So then we jump down here and we say add stu form created student. There's our student object. That student is then going to be stored in the s variable that we declared. Now inside of s, we say students.add our new student. And then we say load students list box. Calling that method takes us here, does the data bind, and then we exit the event handler. And there's our student object. So here we're actually binding the object in its entirety, so we're getting that namespace and class name. To fix that, we'll go back into oh, student override the two string method and we're going to return name f5 actually whack all these breakpoints add a student add and there's the student. All right. I'm now going to go through and do enrollments. I'm going to do it a lot faster because we have 10 minutes. But I want you to see those mechanics again kind of in motion. So let's start with a blank slate, or not a blank slate, but uh, let's get all the other stuff out of the way. All right, so I'm going to move enrollments over here. I'll widen students so we can get full names. All right. Now, before I get into actually doing the enrollments, there's one piece that's going to be very critical is we don't actually have any courses yet. We need to create some courses. There's different approaches to this, but the most simplistic approach is to simply go to the top of our main form and we're going to create an array of courses and we're going to inline declare them using the curly bracket notation. So I'm going to say course all courses and maybe I'll say course uh, array catalog right course catalog equals new course now inside of the curly brackets we're going to do new course and I'm going to create a new course object with the name computer programming one the occupancy will be 20 the room will be 211 five, 211 five I think that's a string subject programming course ID 101 Gonna worry, I'm not going to worry about the rest of those. All right, so that now, what that does for us is inside of our catalog array, we have one course. This line creates one course object with the name computer programming one, occupancy of 20, room 211.5, subject programming course ID 101. One is nice, five is better. Two, three, four, five. And then all we have to do is go in here and make some adjustments.
Okay? So we now have five courses for our catalog. We can make it as long as we want. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of how to create your medicine. Oh look, people looked up. I like it. <laughs> so we now have a catalog. I'm going to do one other small nuance here. I'm going to make that public static. And the reason I'm making it public is that I want my other form to be able to see it. And I'm making it static because I don't want to have to create an instance of my form in order to see this field. Okay, this will make more sense in a minute as to what's going on here. I'm actually going to remove the static piece so that you can see what happens when I incorporate the static keyword there. All right, so do some quick design here. So add enrollment form, toolbox. So let's see, we'll have a label title, label student name, label course. And then I want a, not a list box, where is it, combo box, so this will say student, this will be blank, but it will be called LBL student name. So we'll say courses, and this will be CBO course list. And last but not least, add, add course. The dialog result of cancel. <clears throat> and dialog result of OK. Guess I didn't need that much form after all. All right. This form, I need a way of getting data in. So I need the ability to, I need a public student selected student, the student who needs a course added. Okay, so that's the active student, the one who we're actually manipulating, we're adding a course to. On form load, when the form is loaded, we can say if selected student does not equal null, so if it exists, LBL student name dot text equals selected student dot name. Else message box dot show sorry the student was not defined this dot close I'm actually going to flip this around a little bit. So we'll say if the student is null, do this work, return. Good student, set that, set that label, 
And then we're going to say combo box course list data source equals, and what we want to do is we want to be able to get it from form one. So we say form one dot, and what I want it to see is catalog. Instead, I get check for illegal cross thread calls. Now what I want. Going back to my form, if I say static, and just for a convention, I'm going to make that a capital C. Because I made it static, I can now see that field. Now note that I'm saying it's a field, it's not a property. I could turn it into a property by making some small adjustments, but what I've done is I've just declared a variable called catalog, and I said make it equal to this array. If I wanted to actually make it a property, I'd have to do this, and then I have to take this initialization code, because you notice everything lit up when I added the get and the set. Actually, I can do one even better. I can say get private set, so nobody can mess with it. I then go back into my constructor. Ah, uh, no. I create a static constructor. So instead of making it public, I make it static, because my property is static. Catalog equals one equals sign new course catalog same work but I made it put it into a property and I made it so that it can't be manipulated it can't be reset get access only so I'm encapsulating I'm protecting it I flip back over here go catalog catalog is now a property with get only and it's an array of courses Five. Add student. Add. Add enrollment. Oh, I didn't wire that up yet. Form one. Double click. So here we're going to say add enrollment form. Form equals new add enrollment form. Form dot selected student equals list students dot selected item and because we know this item is a student I'm going to do a cast and we could also do a check and say if list students dot selected index is less than zero which means that there's nothing selected message box dot show no student selected return so we have a student selected we're making that assumption now because we validated so form dot student or form dot selected student equals casting the list students dot selected item as student storing it in that property we can now say form dot show dialog f5 again Add a student, add enrollments, and there are courses. We just need to do the string, the two string. So we come back to course, override, two string, return the name. And we could actually do name course ID F6 F5 and just to show proof there's the no student selected and there's our courses and then we would choose add course still not wired up um, all right, so let's see here. So we we have the student. We load event handler on add course. So 
So we say if selected student not equal null, or we'll say if it equals null. Uh, message box dot show. Yeah, something happened. Return. <coughs> so, assuming selected student exists, we say courses dot add, and then we should just be able to say CBO course list dot selected item. That selected item again is an object, so we have to do a cast course. So we have the student object, it's being passed to us from the main form, which is the same student object because they're passed by reference, the same object that's in the collection. So by us saying selected student.courses.add, we're actually adding the student, or adding the course really, to the student object. We're showing that enrollment association that way. And that's all that we have to do. We don't have to build a pipe to pass the course from the, from the form back to the main form because we've actually passed the student the other way, and then that student carries all of its properties and relationships across that channel. So once that's done, form one, so we say show form. I'm actually going to wrap this in an if statement. So if it equals OK, load enrollment list. I'm going to have it generate a method stub for me. This box enrollments data source equals, and this is where it gets kind of neat. List students dot selected item as student dot courses. So we're taking the a collection of courses from the selected student and putting them in the enrollments box. Kevin G. Enrollments add course. Oh, didn't like something. I'll just write something. Ah. All right, so object reference is not set. So selected student is me. The courses property off of my student is null. The courses property is this list course. How do we make it so it's not null? How do we make courses not null? So what does this line tell the computer? It says, I need you to go find me some memory. Carve me a spot that I can put a list of courses inside of. It's not initialized. We just have that paint space carved out for that list of courses. Here's a ticket. Here's where it lives. Address 5007. What do we have to add to this class, student, so that it's not null anymore? Good thing I got us here, isn't it? Because you all would have got here during your midterm and been like, oh, crap. <laughs> Anybody have any shots in the dark? What's the question? How do we make it so that courses is not null? Put a constructor in and initialize it to a new list. Okay, thank you. So, add a constructor. And we say courses equals new list.
So when the student object is created, that courses property that was carved out then gets initialized with its own list. Without the constructor, without the initialization, you end up with a null variable. That's where it doesn't always work right. <laughs> I'm going to add a breakpoint here. So there are three items in this collection. This data source is not picking them up, and it's not, not that it's not picking them up, it is not redrawing. There is a refresh, which still sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Still doesn't work. So to brute force it, list enrollments, items, clear, clear the list box. For each course C in this, so for each course in the courses collection, list enrollments item dot add C. So manually adding each one one at a time. The clear ensures that it clears and then redraws completely. One, add two, add three. Okay? <coughs> yep. So if you had a uh, second student, would it actually move, like, would it leave white space in between Kevin G and the second student's name, or would it just bring it over? Because then how would it be possible to tell what uh, part of the enrollments is associated with what particular student? So that was the same issue with the binding. Um, so let's see, where is that method? For each student S and student. So students dot clear, no, items clear. The students items add s so that fixes that so what I would want to have happen is I need my s. I want to be able to select a student here and have this list refresh that's what I would want to have happen so to do that you would wire up to the event selected index change So every time you select an item on the left, it then would refresh the list on the right. And since we created this method of load enrollment list, we just say load enrollment list. It'll take whatever is the currently selected student and load that list of student courses for that student. So Kevin G, select the student, computer programming, Web design. Steve. Notice there's nothing there. There's my courses. So that's how you would get that experience. Okay. So, any other questions around that?
I know the last part was kind of fast and furious. I was trying to work to get us added here by around 8. So uh, if you got any questions and you want to ask them one-on-one, -on -one, you can stay after class. This lecture and this project will be available online. Um, the midterm is due the 16th at midnight. So you have until the day before class again to submit. Okay. No class next week. No class next week, correct. And you're going to post the midterm? Yes, the midterm document I'll post before I leave tonight. So this will be up there at the lecture. I'll work to get up. And then that midterm document will be up there as well. Okay? All right. Thank you, guys.